I'd like to welcome you to this research presentation about the science of molecular machines that is research carried out at the Institute of Structural and Molecular Biology at University College London. But before I go to the scientific details, let me just introduce myself. My name is Finn Werner. I was born as a member of the Danish minority in northern Germany. I subsequently carried out my academic training at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, did some research at the Finsen Laboratory of the Cancer Research in Denmark and at the Thrombosis Research Institute in the United Kingdom. And as you can see, I'm a genuine European, being born in Germany, having been educated in Denmark and now living in the United Kingdom. This is a key part of being a scientist, to be internationally mobile. So I uh, obtained my PhD studies at Imperial College London, where my interest for the molecular mechanisms of RNA polymerase was raised. After a short period of postdocing, I became a group leader at University College London, first lecturer, then professor, uh, became a Wellcome Trust investigator in 2011, and finally I'm serving as a director for the Institute for Structural Molecular Biology here at UCL. So all of us have different types of motivations to become scientists in, in, in academia. And so my enthusiasm is driven by curiosity. I want to know how life works. And that's what I've been working on for the last 25 years and more. So as you can see from the short biography, I've worked at different universities in Denmark and in the UK. I've worked in hospital research departments, public and private research institutes. And of all of those, I'm proud to say that UCL is by far the most exciting and rewarding environment to carry out academic research. But now let me talk about the science. So after this personal perspective, a perspective, I will introduce you to the evolution of life on Earth, this comprehensive and cohesive intellectual framework that explains how all living organisms on this planet share a common ancestry. I then will talk about the role of inf biological information and how this information is perpetuated and handed down. This is essentially the dogma of gene expression. DNA makes RNA makes protein. I then will talk a bit more in detail about the key player, the gatekeeper of the genome, the RNA polymerases, the uh, object of, of all our studies. And I will talk a bit about the approaches that we take, the, 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 the technical and experimental approaches to study these molecular machines. And there are two key terms that are important which is multiscalarity and multidisciplinarity. And I will talk about the meaning and the importance of those two terms. And then finally, I will open up the field a bit wider and talk about different types of molecular machines and why it is important how these machines work in order to understand biology, both in the context of health and disease. But before I get into the nitty gritty details of molecular machines and the research that we do, let me cast the net a bit wider and talk about the context here. So I start my slide with this Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is an artifact that is 2,000 years old. It's an Egyptian stele, and it sings praise to King Ptolemy V. So the reason I'm, I'm mentioning the Rosetta Stone here is that it is one of the most viewed artifacts at the British Museum, which is only a few hundred meters a stone throws away from our research department at UCL. Okay, so as you can see, it's an Egyptian stele, yet it sings praise to a Greek king. Ptolemy V. And this is obviously because Egypt was under Greek rule at the time being. This also meant that this song of praise was written in three different languages, hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. So Greek was the language of the government bureaucrats in office. Demotic was the language that the literary Egyptians spoke, the language on the street. And hieroglyphic was the highbrow religious language that at that stage already was 3,000 years old. And so, because the French archaeologists that undug the stone were fluent in Greek and had a good understanding of Demotic, they soon discovered that these texts here were translated word by word from one to another. And so that enabled them to decipher the third unknown language, hieroglyphic. And this is a momentous uh, uh, occasion, a true breakthrough in the field of archaeology, because suddenly it was possible to read the hieroglyphs that were the language uh, on all of the, the, the tombs and, and the pyramids and the, the sphinx and, and so on. And so the reading of these hieroglyphs enabled the archaeologists to study Egyptian literature and thereby understand and study Egyptian civilization. So 2,000 years later, two very eminent scientists, Jim Watson and Francis Crick, discovered that there are also three languages in biology that are important, namely DNA and RNA and protein. And so Francis Crick was very quick in paraphrasing this as 
the central dogma of molecular biology, which describes the flow of information. The information is encoded in DNA in our genomes. It is transcribed into a working copy called RNA, which then is again translated into protein, which is the stuff that, that our cells are made of. And so this analogy between the Rosetta Stone and these three languages in biology is pertinent. It is more important now than at any other stage because we live in the so-called post-genomic era. We have huge amount of genome sequence information available, including from humans. And we now need to be able to read this nucleic acid literature in order to understand the protein civilization of the cell. And so reading the nucleic acid literature was precisely what lots of scientists did in the 1970s and 80s, and in particular now as well. So I'd like to point out one particular person who was very keen on reading RNA, in particular short RNA fragments from ribosomes, and his name was Carl Wuss. So he compared the sequences of RNA of as many organisms as he could get hold of, and he aligned the sequences and looked at similarities and differences. And soon he found out that every single living organism on this planet belongs to either one of three groups. These are phrased bacteria, archaea, or eukaryotes. And so this connection between all living cells on, on, on this planet is called phylogeny. And so this phylogeny of RNA that Carl studied reveals the language of evolution. It's a contextual, cohesive, intellectual framework that connects all living organisms on this planet, reflected by their ancestry. They are all evolved from each other. And I will talk a bit more about that in a bit. But let me here point out that Carl was particularly happy or interested in this group of organisms called the archaea, because these archaea share the cellular architecture of the bacteria. That means if you look through a microscope, the bacteria and archaea look very much alike here, two examples up here. However, when looking at the sequence context and looking at the molecular architecture of these organisms, the archaea, they were much more akin to the eukaryotic brethren than they were to the bacteria. So bacteria, archaea, and eukarya a seemingly independent domain of life. So when Carl first put forward these hypotheses, people in the field did not receive that well. They liked to look at organisms through a microscope and they liked to look at these, these, these structures and uh, weren't particularly keen on looking at the molecular structure and the sequences and, 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 and so on. And so he received a lot of flack for that and became a, became a bit of a recluse who, who stopped attending conferences and so on. So if it weren't for two uh, famous German biochemists, Wolfram Zillig and, and, and Karl Stetter, who studied the molecular architecture of these RNA polymerases that we worked on, that lent credence to the fact that the archaea, in fact, were much closer related to eukaryotes than they were to the bacteria in terms of evolution. So when I started becoming interested in science approximately 30 years ago, I was fascinated by this huge diversity of life on Earth. You've got this massive range of, of different types of organisms. And what we struck in particular was the fact that it is not the stuff that these organisms are made of that creates the diversity, but it is the execution of the genetic program. It is the biological information inherent in the genes and genomes of these organisms that drives uh, this fantastic diversity of life on Earth. And, and so I decided to dedicate my life to, to understanding how these genetic programs worked and in particular how they were executed in the cell. And so it's important to take the time into consideration here, the passage of time in context of geology. We are going back in time here. There, there are different, arch uh, different eras here. You can see modern day uh, archaeologists up, up, up here and, and different types of, of, of fossil record. And so this kind of illustration shows the passage of geological time. So the passage of geological time is accompanied by the passage of biological time. And again, this is evolution of life on Earth. In this tree here illustrated the three main branches, bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes. And so these three domains of life can be recognized in molecular structure. And so here I'm getting closer and closer to the kind of topics that we study at the Institute for, for Structural and Molecular Biology. Because it turns out that the molecular machines that carry out the decoding of the genetic information, so the first step in gene expression from DNA to RNA, these are the molecules that are universally conserved throughout evolution. And so you can recognize that throughout evolution here, you have in the bacteria a simple RNA polymerase, 
which is the name of this enzyme, that contains four different components which are color coded here. So the color coding uh, is, is also maintained here in the RNA polymerases from archaea and eukaryotes. And you can see from the shape of the molecule that is often likened to a crop claw here that is present in all of these molecular machines. So RNA polymerases are key machines for gene expression and they are all evolutionary conserved, which means that the ancestral versions of these molecular machines go billions of years back in time. And so the similarity, uh, you know, if I put it like that, is, uh, it, it is quite clear. But if you think about it, it is really strange and fascinating because archaea are, as I mentioned in my introduction, more like bacteria. Unicellular organisms, in particular the archaea that we study, live under very hostile environments here at volcanic vents in the deep sea or in boiling mud pits. So this is essentially boiling uh, sulfuric acid here. So these are the RNA polymerase of the archaea that live in these uh, kind of uh, environments. However, this is the RNA polymerase that Homo sapiens uses. RNA polymerases that carry out the decoding of the genetic information in all of your body. And look at how similar these enzymes are. Despite we are so different on the organism level, the molecular machines that drive our biological processes are highly conserved. So what kind of analysis do we carry out? So we liken these molecular machines, the RNA polymerases that carry out transcription, to other molecular machines that we are maybe more used to in our daily lives. Let's say, for example, engines. Engines are built into larger vehicles, cars, and these engines consist of individual parts. So if you want to understand how the engine works, you can take it apart or you can build it in larger complexes in order to study. So this is called a reductionist approach, where we try to identify which of these bits here, the pistons and, and what have we, cylinder blocks and so on, how do they contribute to the function of the engine and how does that make the car work in this case. And so uh, RNA polymerases consist of different parts, just like the car engine. And so in our lab, we build these RNA polymerases in the test tube. We make a recombinant version of all of these individual parts and then we build the engines together. This is a kind of Lego approach where you start with individual components and then uh, you build the, the Millennium Falcon here. And if you take a close look, the shape of the Millennium Falcon can easily be recognized in the RNA polymerase itself. So having established this, this system, we can now perturb this. That means that we can interfere with its function. For example, by molecular genetics. This is introducing mutations of different sites of these subunits. We can also introduce things, so for example, molecular beacons that can be measured to, chain, to, to analyze the changes in protein structure. Then we can determine the structural information. This is X-ray crystallography, cryoelectron microscopy, or nuclear magnetic resonance. And finally, we can use a lot of computational methods in order to understand how these machines work. And so over the years, we've used this, the, these, these systems and all of these methods I, I mentioned in order to study RNA polymerases. So RNA polymerases um, consist of uh, uh, the, the RNA polymerase itself and then different types of factors. So we have solved the structure of some of these complexes and some of these factors in order to understand how transcription works. So RNA polymerase initiate transcription at the promoter, then they go through different steps, and then they go through an elongation phase of transcription, where there are different factors that associate with the RNA polymerase, then they terminate transcription, and they start initiating uh, transcription again. And so by following this reductionist approach, we have determined in very high detail how these machines are built together, what the structure of the individual parts are, and how all together um, it works. So the analysis I've shown you so far have occurred at the molecular level. So we've captured the structure and the function of these molecules in the test tube in isolation. And it's very important to follow this reductionist approach if you want to carry out a rigorous functional dissection of a large molecular machine like an RNA polymerase. So what you get out of these studies is to understand how the engine works, how the part works, and how, in this case, the car works, the larger machine that you're interested in. However, this is also where it ends, because if you are interested in more than cars and engines and their part, in, let's say, you are interested in traffic in an entire city, you need a completely different type of analysis. So these are referred to as 
analysis at the systems level or genome or global or cellular or organismal level of the cell. And so pertinent questions to ask about RNA polymerases in this context is the distribution of the RNA polymerase across the entire genomes and the way by which the ebb and flow of these RNA polymerases across the genes regulates the genetic program of the cell. Uh, other questions that are not accessible by a reductionist approach but that require a systems level analysis is the interaction with other machines in the dynamic processes that they carry out. So, for example, DNA polymerases during replication make use of the same DNA template like the RNA polymerases do during transcription. And particular collisions between transcription elongation complexes and the replication fork can result in the uh, impairment of genome stability, and that is important, it's involved in, in, in cancer. But finally, an important question to ask is also, what, what is the purpose of the engine? So the purpose of the RNA polymerase is to produce RNA. The purpose of the car is to transport people forth and back. And so, in order to capture the system-wide level properties of RNA polymerase, it is similar or akin to cars or vehicles altogether moving across the entire city. So, in order to address these questions, you need a different type of uh, analysis. This is often referred to as chromatin immunoprecipitation. Remember that I illustrated the function of RNA polymerases in terms of the so-called transcription cycle that initiated transcription, this is a blue phase here, focused on promoter DNA sequence elements that are illustrated here. So if this is a gene, this is the open reading frame, this is a promoter and this is a terminator of transcription. So in order to follow how these transcription initiation complexes, whose structures we resolved and, and I've shown them in previous slides, how these guys assemble on these specific DNA sequences at the promoter. This is shown here. We also then have the RNA polymerase after firing, after leaving the promoter, going into the transcription elongation phase. This would correspond to the central, the body of the transcription unit. At the end of the transcription unit then, transcription has to terminate in order to be able to reinitiate again and go through the same cycle again. Now the systems type of analysis are shown in the right hand panel here describes a mapping of the transcription start sites. These are kind of traffic lights or junctions if, if you like. Then we have a chromatin immunoprecipitation approach called ChIP-seq here that maps the precise occupancy of these transcription elongation complexes within the body of the gene. And then finally also we characterize the RNA, the passengers if you like, with the analogy with the car. The passengers here are measured by a transcriptome approach where we measure RNA across the entire genome. And so the purpose of this whole analysis is now to integrate all of this disparate information. So integrate information that we have obtained by structural biology, by biochemical experiments describing the function and the catalytic activities of these enzymes, and then complete the picture of that by describing how all of these RNA polymerases move across the genome. So this is a multidisciplinary analysis because it involves different disciplines, structural biology, biochemistry, biophysics, systems biology, next generation sequence methods, and it is also a multiscalar analysis because it looks at things at the very small level, these are nanometers here, in a different type of scale across the entire genome. This region is maybe 10 kilobases big. And the entire in vivo approaches happen in the cell where you operate at the scale of, let's say, 10 to 100 micrometer. So it's multidisciplinary because you use different techniques. It's multiscalars because you look at different scales in biology. And the key is now to integrate all that different information into one coherent or holistic, if you like, picture of transcription. Okay, so I'd like to end my, my bit about RNA polymerases here and now I'd like to turn your attention to more generic aspects of this research, which is the mechanisms of several molecular machines, which is a particular focus of the research at our Institute for, for Structural and Molecular Biology. So this again is following what I introduced, the flow of biological information in the cell, replication, translation, transcription, translation, the folding of the proteins that are found, all of these proteins have to be understood in detail. It has to be understood in the context. And we have to integrate the knowledge of these mechanisms throughout here. And this integration is important because processes happen at the same time. So for example, the synthesis of DNA by replication has to be precisely coordinated 
with the synthesis of RNA, because otherwise the replication fork and the transcription elongation complexes would collide, and that creates huge problems for genome stability and the execution of the gene expression program. Likewise, the two steps in gene expression, namely transcription, DNA to RNA, and translation, RNA to protein, have to be physically coupled and tightly functionally coordinated in order to make a maximum use of the resources in the cell. Furthermore, the processes of translation, protein synthesis, and protein folding, them adapting the, in, in the big molecular foundries, the chaperoning systems of the cell, this has to be tightly coupled in order to prevent misfolding of proteins, which can lead to diseases. And so this scheme here is just looking at some of the most important machines that are involved in the processing of biological information in the cell. But there are many more molecules that we study that are important in terms of molecular machines. So, for example, here we have um, a dynein walking along a microtubuli. So this is a movie that doesn't work, but here it goes. Um, the important thing is that this is dynein. It's a molecule that walks along microtubuli and it transports these large vesicles, which contain a car cargo to precise subcellular localizations uh, in the cell. And so uh, I hope to have given you an impression uh, of, of the vast complexity of, of the cell here. I've been talking about replication, about transcription, translation. I briefly mentioned protein trafficking, the dining molecules here. But molecular machines are involved in literally every single important process in the cell, including metabolism, changes in cell shape, the movement of cells in, in motility, but also cell differentiation, secretion processes, and so on and so forth. And again, the important thing to note is here that all of these processes do not occur independently in the cell. They are tightly coordinated and regulated. And so, in summary, this is a complex interplay of highly dynamic processes that has been optimized for cellular efficiency throughout evolution for the time of several billion years. And molecular information is not an island. It is molecular information that is handed over from machine to machine in the cell. Now, considering that these processes are very important, it cannot come as a surprise that if these machines contain defects by mutations, it leads to disease. Basically, a, a large array of important diseases are affected and can be directly attributed uh, to machines. And this uh, includes cancer, infection, autoimmune diseases, neurodegeneration, metabolic disorders, and cardiovascular diseases. So if the medics of the future need any kind of chance to address these diseases, we first need to understand the underlying molecular reality of the machines that facilitate the biological processes. So this might be fundamental research at the current time, but it is critical that this fundamental understanding of biology is promoted in order to uh, the therapies and diagnostic tools and, and, and so on are being developed uh, in, the, in the future. And so at this stage, just a couple of slides to, to, to our general approach. We pride ourselves at the Institute for Structural Molecular Biology to carry out science that is fit for purpose for the 21st century. And there were two key themes that I've alluded to in my talk here, and that is multidisciplinarity. That refers to the fact that we cannot only apply a single method in order to address important biological questions. But we have, used, we have to use multiple technology platforms and multiple disciplines. At our institute, we are very strong in structural and, and uh, structure determination here, using crystallography, electron microscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance, electron paramagnetic resonance, but also super resolution microscopy. This is now uh, uh, you know, going into the realm of entire cells, synthetic biology, which is manipulating these networks in, in, in order to, to achieve particular goals. It's the application of biochemical and biophysical methods in order to study molecular function. At the larger scales here now, we are moving from in vitro to the in vivo scenario. We use structural methods like electron tomography to probe the internal subcellular structures of, of the cell. Systems biology, I mentioned to get an idea about the whole genome expression pattern and the whole genome occupancy profiles of all the systems that are involved in the processing of biological information. And we use micro and cell biology to understand how these machines work in a larger context of the, of the entire cells. So multidisciplinarity refers to the different technology platforms. The second important word is married to multidisciplinarity, 
which is multiscalarity, which refers to the fact that we work at different scales from atoms to molecules to cells to biofilms to entire organisms here. And so the mission statement of the Institute for Structural and Molecular Biology is that we bring together scientists from a broad range of backgrounds, different disciplines, and we all share a passion for discovery to address important research questions in a holistic fashion. That means in vitro and in vivo from the atomic to the systems level of biology. And so if you're interested in any of uh, what, what I've been discussing here, uh, there are two books I would like to recommend. One of them is called Molecular Machines in Biology, Workshop of the Cell, written by Joachim Frank, and a textbook in structural biology which describes more technically the, the kind of approaches that we take in order to, to study uh, molecular structure and function. And so finally, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a bit of an advertisement here. I, I, I told you at, at the beginning in my personal perspective that I initially came to UCL just to learn a few techniques in, in terms of a scientific collaboration. This is now more than 25 years ago. I never left because this place is brilliant. At UCL, which is a very large international global institution that is Brexit and COVID-19 compliant, we do all sorts of exciting research. UCL uh, is embedded in the in the heart, in, in the center of London. We offer both undergraduate pro programs and postgraduate programs. And last but not least, I'd like to point out that we might study hard, but we also party hard. And the scope for theater and concerts and clubbing is absolutely vast. So with this, I'd just like you for your attention and hope to see you at UCL soon. Thank you and goodbye.